Well, it looks as if the numbers have leveled off, so we shall begin. So, uh, welcome and good afternoon. And uh, thank you very much for joining us for what is the second of the Crime Team's talk in this Goldsmith webinar series. Uh, I unfortunately am not Jerry Hayes. Uh, alas, I lack the brilliant white beard and colourful glasses uh, to pull off an accurate impression of him. Unfortunately, uh, as is uh, one of the pitfalls of our work, Jerry has been called away on uh, other business. We are very hopeful that Jerry will be able to give his part of the lecture on disclosure later on during the webinar series, which I'm very pleased to say has now been extended to the end of uh, June. However, please do not be saddened by the fact that we are lacking Jerry, as instead it just simply means that you're going to have much more time to spend with my colleague, Harry O'Sullivan. Uh, for, those you, for those of you who are not aware, Harry has been a tenant of Goldsmith Chambers since October 2018, following the successful completion of his pupillage. It would be fair to say that Harry is a rising star in the crime team, or, well, I say it's fair, but actually, if anything, that's doing Harry a disservice, because frankly, <laughs> he is now one of the shining lights of the crime team. Not only is he a sole crime practitioner who has grade two uh, CPS uh, half uh, to uh, do prosecution work, he also uh, has a very large defense practice. Most importantly, however, for today's webinar, he is the author of the 15th edition of Banks on Sentence, also known as Banks on Sentence 2020. Additionally, he is the general editor for the monthly update, so many of you will be very well aware of Harry's work already as a result of having banks on sentence or if you are signed up to the monthly update. If I could just take this opportunity to remind you all of the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, I would urge you please to ask your questions in the Q&A box as and when they come up throughout the lecture. Please don't wait until the end as I will be collating those questions and Harry has very kindly put aside five minutes at the end of his webinar to answer those questions for you. So without any further ado, may I introduce Harry O'Sullivan for today's webinar. Afternoon everybody. Um, of course, if there aren't any questions, five minutes might be too much and uh, I'm clearly going to give away more than five minutes if we have more questions to answer. Um, so if I start, and hopefully this will work without a hitch, although given the internet that uh, it goes without saying sometimes, uh, switch to the slideshow. So hopefully, if I've done that right, you can now all see, rather than my face large on your screens, the, uh, the PowerPoint. Um, so I'll move straight ahead then to the uh, first page, which deals simply with an overview of what I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, largely, of course, it's the subject everybody's been hearing about to death, the impact of COVID-19 on the criminal justice system. Uh, I'll be talking about a couple of elements of uh, its impact on sentencing and how it can help and hinder in, in sentencing hearings. Uh, some other areas I'll be talking about that sort of flow from that, uh, release arrangements, uh, new availability of certain measures within uh, community orders and suspended sentences, uh, the changes to the statutory surcharge, that annoying chunk of money that everyone's asked to pay at the end of everything. Uh, finally, some upcoming material expected from the Sentencing Council in the next year or so. Uh, but first of all, uh, coronavirus, uh, what it's done to the prison population, what it's done to sentences. Uh, the first thing I'll be talking about is, is a case called Manning. Um, essentially, it's been known for some time and people have tried to argue that uh, because people going to prison are now going to be under much more difficult conditions, uh, lengthier periods of time in custody, uh, lengthier periods of time in lockdown, that prison today is, is harsher than it would have been before. Um, it's been argued in the abstract uh, by many people appearing before the Crown Court and before the magistrates that this is a factor they should take into account. Well, this case, the Attorney's General, General uh, reference case of Manning, uh, the facts uh, almost don't enter into what we need to talk about today. But one thing that's quite useful in that case is that the court has lent its weight to the argument that essentially because prison is harsher now than it was before, uh, that that can be a factor leading towards suspension 
or leading towards shorter sentence than otherwise could have been handed down. Um, and to that end, we've got some quotes that I've, I've taken from the relevant chunk of the case. Uh, the effect of it is that uh, the Attorney General asked the, the Court of Appeal to increase a sentence for some sexual offending against children. Uh, they did increase the sentence, but they increased it uh, not to immediate custody, but to a longer period of suspension. Uh, and the court in its judgment noted there uh, that it, it's right for the court to consider uh, why coronavirus has made prison harsher. And we have at the bottom of this slide here uh, the quote uh, about the impact on custody of, of that uh, lockdown situation, uh, as well as the fact that as well as um, not being allowed out of their cells for upwards of 23 hours a day in some situations, uh, there haven't been any prison visits taking place, so no, no family members have been able to go in person into custody for uh, some months, since the 26th of March, I believe. Um, which takes us to uh, a, another consideration, which is that where people haven't been in custody, where their cases have been deemed lower priority, the impact of coronavirus effectively has been that the system has ground to a halt, uh, that normal sentence hearings haven't been taking place, that people haven't been progressing as fast through the already slowed down system as they might have done. Lengthier delays are a well-recognized factor that can weigh in favor of mitigation. Uh, we have it here taken from the overarching principles guideline about how delay through no one's fault or, or through certainly no fault of the offender can have a detrimental effect. Uh, and in mitigation, anyone would be expecting to point to this factor as something that that helps their client's position. Um, it would also, in many cases, allow a further opportunity to demonstrate remorse, demonstrate prospects of rehabilitation, uh, demonstrate that it wouldn't be fair, given the amount of time that this has spent pending, to now send somebody into custody. Uh, so these are all factors that are, uh, have arisen as a result of the uh, ongoing crisis. Uh, and that is there we have we have further detail on that point where the delay is dealt with in in the case where somebody has been sat in custody sat waiting for a trial or waiting to enter a plea or for pleas to now be accepted we have a sentence that has been greatly delayed perhaps while somebody's been sat in in custody waiting for it to happen there will be cases there will be more cases than before where people are going to be sentenced to less time than they've already spent on remand. Uh, and that's the sort of case where the guideline on what the right outcome should be, uh, because it could be that you invite the court to impose the length of custody that they've served, um, or it could be that you invite the court to deal with it with a conditional or absolute discharge. Uh, the difficulty for the court is going to be the impact on the license condition, because if somebody spends a period of time in custody, there is potentially a year of post-sentence supervision. Whereas, of course, an absolute or conditional discharge would A, look much better on their record and B, not trigger those, those license conditions. Um, we have, of course, all heard about the various fines that have been dealt out to people breaching the lockdown restrictions. Uh, and perhaps we've heard more about certain people who haven't been fined uh, for likely breaching the lockdown restrictions, though unlike the Attorney General, I won't comment on whether or not a criminal offence may or may not have happened. Um, those, those regulations have been amended uh, a number of times, uh, piecemeal and in almost every case overnight, not the usual 21 day rule to the Labour before Parliament, but uh, amendments made very quickly, uh, as is necessary, responding to an ongoing situation. Uh, but for sentencing purposes, one crucial part of this has been the uh, regime for fixed penalty notices. Um, it, the situation as it now stands is that a, a routine breach by an individual would be met with a £100 fixed penalty notice. Uh, that would be half to 50 if you paid it within 14 days. Subsequent offenders, so those caught repeatedly breaching the lockdown, by the time they breach it and are found breaching it the sixth time, the fixed penalty notice would be rising to £3,200. Uh, and of course, this is all predicated on somebody accepting responsibility, accepting the fixed penalty notice akin to a caution, uh, an admission of guilt, uh, albeit not a conviction. Um, if that person declined to accept it or, or didn't pay the fine, uh, didn't pay the fixed penalty notice, they would be potentially prosecuted 
uh, and we have relatively little information about what happens in these cases because most most situations going before the court that people have heard about have been uh, in fact uh, wrongful prosecutions under the wrong restriction but nevertheless all we're told is that they are punishable on summary conviction by a fine uh, so that's just some detail about the offences themselves um, we're also told that uh, much of the prison population has been uh, dramatically re reduced or is set to be dramatically reduced so as to try to work towards a situation where prisoners would not be sharing cells or it would be possible in the population to have people able to self-isolate and to quarantine themselves in place within the uh, prison system. Um, the reality though has been a little further from the truth and uh, despite extending uh, early release to, to large classes of prisoners in, in statutory instrument, the actual release figures have been very low. Something in the region of 80 or 90 prisoners have been released. Uh, six were released in error back in May and the whole programme was uh, suspended for, for some time. Uh, so it does seem that the uh, situation is, is a moving one. Um, and one where the government is is at least trying to make the right steps in the right direction, uh, but struggling in practice to put those into effect. Uh, the bottom point here, we have a separate issue, a separate but related issue about home detention curfew release. Uh, there is a draft statutory instrument that we probably all ought to look out for that would extend uh, HDC release from the current rule that somebody would have to be within four and a half months of their release uh, to a situation where somebody could be released on curfew within six months of when they were expected to be released. Uh, that's been laid before Parliament but not yet uh, discussed or, or enacted or, or even brought to the fore. So it's something they're thinking about all with, a, with an aim to reducing the population um, but mixed, mixed results have uh, come out so far. Um, that takes us to a, a slightly different topic, which isn't directly coronavirus related, but is uh, in some way tangential to it, in that we are again talking about release from custody. Uh, two, two changes that came in earlier this year. Um, they're similar, but somewhat different. We have one set of release arrangement changes in uh, primary legislation in, a, in an act, the Terrorist Offenders Release uh, Restriction of Early Release Act, uh, came into force on the 26th of February. Uh, the other one, the next slide, I'll, I'll come back to that one, uh, deals with the alteration of the relevant proportion of sentence order, so the release of prisoners. Uh, talking first about the first of those, the terrorist offenders rule simply says from the 26th of February, all persons falling into a very broad category of terrorist offenders will no longer be eligible for automatic release. Um, so assuming that somebody had received a, a, a normal determinate length uh, fixed term sentence for a terrorist offence, rather than being released automatically after serving half, uh, they would be only releasable after serving two thirds and only then at the discretion of the parole board. Um, so a, a relatively big change for a relatively small number of cases. Uh, bearing in mind that the most serious terrorist offenders might well have been receiving uh, extended sentences if they were deemed dangerous anyway. Uh, so we're talking about specific types of offenders who aren't falling into that first category, uh, but are deemed terrorists because they have committed an offence that is uh, listed in the schedule to that. So one of the Terrorist Act offences, um, multiple attacks, murders, anything deemed to have a terrorist connection either here or in Scotland falls into that category. Um, but the parole board were consulted and they said that actually uh, this change is relatively unlikely to have any big impact on the prison population because of just how few terrorist offenders there are in the system. Uh, what's important to note here though is that this change is not brought into effect for people yet to be sentenced. It's, it's brought into effect for all terrorist offenders regardless of when they were originally sentenced. Uh, the only type of people who escape effect by this change is terrorist offenders who've already been released on license. Uh, so it's otherwise than that class retroactive. Uh, and it's very much uh, a response to the Usman Khan uh, attack in South London uh, earlier this year. 
Uh, the other change, not a response to any direct uh, incident, it is the government wanting to seem to be harder on serious crime. Uh, it's the government who wants to seem that they are doing more for the worst offenders, that they are ending early release for those class of people. Uh, this one, uh, important distinction, is only effective from the 1st of April for people who are sentenced on or after that date. So it doesn't sweep up all those people who are currently serving sentences. It has no impact on those people or, or people who have already been released. Um, it only catches adult defendants or offenders. It only catches people who have been convicted of relevant, serious, violent or sexual offences. So the Schedule 15 lists uh, that people will be used to for the extended sentences. Um, the biggest uh, and perhaps strangest part of this is that it only catches people who receive sentences of seven years or longer. Um, so we do have to ask ourselves when we're looking at the impact of this, how likely is it that somebody would have been convicted of a very serious offence uh, falling into the Schedule 15 list where the court would already be giving them seven years or more anyway, where there isn't already consideration given to whether they are dangerous within the meaning of the extended determinants or even life sentences uh, that were already available to the court. So this change uh, allows uh, a great announcement about ending early release for the most serious offenders. Uh, I suspect, and this is my private view, it won't make that much difference at all to the, to the outcome. Uh, it certainly hasn't changed anything that's available to any court. It's merely changing the point at which the Secretary of State would uh, be allowed to release somebody from custody. Uh, and in this case, it's automatic. Uh, it's automatic without the parole board's intervention, uh, but it's at two thirds of the sentence and not halfway through. Uh, so we have to ask ourselves what an extra sixth of a sentence has done uh, in terms of ending automatic early release for those small class of offenders. Uh, this takes us to a, a somewhat different topic. Uh, this seeming jumble of slides information with dates and numbers is the uh, 14th commencement order to the, uh, to the much hated LASPO. Um, this change is, and you'll note that this was a part of LASPO on the statute book for eight years, brought into force in 2012 uh, with various powers to pilot it, but the order itself bringing it into force eight years later, 2020, from the 19th of May onwards. Uh, what does it do? Well, after successfully being piloted, or, or, or pilots that have been deemed successful, uh, the government has brought into force for the all of England and Wales uh, the alcohol abstinence monitoring requirement. Uh, so this is a tag provided by a private company uh, to allow electronic monitoring of alcohol abstinence as the court or probation might require. Uh, it's a tag like an ankle tag, like a, a, a location monitoring tag that's capable of uh, detecting alcohol levels in sweat. It transmits the information and it can tell whether somebody who's been given an order, a requirement to stay away from alcohol is breaching it. Uh, there is also power for the uh, levels, uh, for it to be a fixed level or fixed time. So it could be that somebody is told you can have a drink, but you can't go above the drink drive limit. Or it could be that somebody is told you can have a drink at the weekend, but not during the week. Uh, it does allow for a great deal of, um, of creativity, invention on the part of the sentencing court and gives uh, in theory, uh, a great deal of power to deal with some difficult offenders to probation, where in other circumstances, somebody might have no option but to be sent to custody for repeated offending related to alcohol. Uh, so that, in theory, gives uh, some degree of, um, of latitude to courts and to probation to, uh, to really provide some problem solving in difficult situations. Uh, one thing to look out for is whether in fact it is actually available in the local justice area that the court is dealing with because although the power is now available to the court the other part of its availability is determined by whether the secretary of state has appointed a, uh, a, a approved person a, a company in that area to offer the scheme uh, i would expect this is the sort of thing that probation would be very keen on promoting in their pre-sentence reports if they find that this is a, a person before them who has a clear alcohol problem. Um, but having said all of that, this is not an order that's permissible for the court to give 
if you have somebody who is alcohol dependent, they don't want to start straying into the, the category of offering um, this as a treatment. It is meant to be a uh, deterrent. Um, so it, it is a somewhat difficult one to, to measure up. Uh, when they piloted it in London, it, it's said to have had great success. Uh, they piloted it in, in the north, uh, northeast. We see Yorkshire and Humber and Lincoln uh, more recently, but for, for slightly less time. Uh, and again, it was said to have had success there. So having passed its pilot stage, it's been brought into force. Whether we ever see any more of it ever again, whether it's left to quietly die on the vine, uh, it remains to be seen. It'll be ultimately down to probation and private companies to, to tender for the uh, contract to offer this. Um, a topic that is uh, perhaps boring and incredibly technical, ultimately it is unnecessarily complicated, unnecessarily frequently changed. Uh, my own view is that it is misleading. It's often known as the victim surcharge and it's promoted as a way for the government to make crime pay and return uh, the, the proceeds of crime to victims. That is that is wrong. It's the fault of its name. It's the fault of the way it's presented in court. Magistrates are given a card to read that says it will go to fund victim services. Um, there is very little evidence of that. There is some very outdated information from as, as late as 2014 to suggest that it goes into a general fund, some of which might be used to fund services that might be used towards the assistance of victims of crime. Uh, I remain cynical on that front. Nevertheless, the court requ is required to order it. Um, certainly for the Crown Court, the advice is and has been for some time, it's too complicated, don't worry about it, just declare if it applies, it applies accordingly in the amount to be calculated, that's enough, and then it'll be dealt with administratively. Uh, because if you get it wrong, you can lower it on appeal, you can't increase it on appeal. If you forget to apply it, it can't be added on appeal. Um, and certainly no one's going to be going, one hopes, certainly no one's going to be seeking to slip rule a case because they forgot to add 140 pounds, but madder things have happened. Um, so what's happened most recently is that in the middle of the coronavirus crisis and with uh, legislation time through the floor, government resources stretched, they decided it would be an excellent time to try to up the surcharge once again. Uh, so for offences committed, and that's a very important distinction, it's not sentences imposed, it's not convictions, it's offences committed on or after the 14th of April of this year, uh, the surcharge values have gone up again. And the way you figure out what they are is you figure out what the sentence is, you look at a table in the back of the schedule that creates the order, and it tells you the value of the surcharge for a given sentence. From the 14th of April, some of them have gone up by a single pound, some of them have gone up by as much as nine pounds. I would love to find out which government minister has a somewhat different assessment of inflation and interest uh, rises and cost of price of living over the last year since they last updated it last summer. Um, but certainly, I don't think anything else, certainly not fees at the criminal bar, have gone up by as much as nine pounds in the last year. Um, it, as I say, is unnecessarily complicated. And in the ideal case, it's relatively simple. You say this person's received a fine, they can be given a surcharge of 10% of the fine up to a level, that's simple. Likewise, custody depends on whether it's under six months, six months to two years, or over two years. What's less simple, and we have a case that deals with this at the bottom, is the situation where, for example, you have somebody who is breaching an order or has multiple offences before the court at once. Um, and a case from earlier this year, uh, the Court of Appeal tried its very best to try and simplify this situation um, because although this is a relatively small amount of money. It's nevertheless a, a mandatory part of the sentence uh, and £149 is a seemingly derisory sum to the victim of the crime who doesn't receive it himself uh, but might be quite a lot of money to the defendant who'll be still on the hook to pay it sometime after they release from custody. Uh, so we have three principles to derive from that case. Uh, the first is that if you are uh, having a, a that includes two or more parts. So if you commit two offences and they're both sentenced together, 
and you get custody for both of them, uh, you, you add them up. So you take the total length of custody, you take the total amount of any fine in aggregate and use that as the basis to calculate what the surcharge will be. You don't look to the largest part, uh, you don't try to take the average. There have been no numerous attempts by courts that have got it wrong. Um, a slightly more, I say slightly more interesting, and then I caught myself and remember that it isn't really that interesting, but it's a technical point that's uh, perhaps useful, is that if you are breaching an order, so if you breach a community order and you're brought back before the court, or you're breaching a suspended sentence by committing a new offence and you're back before the court, uh, the court should not impose the surcharge again. Uh, it's imposed it once, you've in theory paid it once or, or are due to pay it once for one offence and you don't fall to be paying a double surcharge or a second surcharge just because you are back before the court to be in theory sentenced again for the breach. Uh, but the point that's made at the bottom in the third point here is the uh, possibly most complicated part of all which is that because they've updated the surcharge value so often, there's about five different tables of what those values might be for every given offence. Um, and when somebody, for example, is back before the court having breached a suspended sentence by committing a new offence, uh, although they don't get a fresh surcharge for the uh, breach, they do get a surcharge for the new offence. Uh, but when you look to calculate what the value of the surcharge should be, what the court said is that it shouldn't be based on the date that offence was committed. It should be based on the date the original offence was committed. So the offence that you've got the suspended sentence for to begin with. I know that sounds insane. I know that sounds complicated, but it is ultimately the tricky combination of what happens when the court, uh, sorry, when the, when the uh, legislation is constantly changed reflecting on its face from or, uh, offences committed on or after the date. Uh, they could make this a lot simpler. Uh, I don't know why they don't, but they are very, very conscious never to be seen to uh, legislate retroactively. And uh, for some reason that matters a lot more to them when it's a nine pound increase as opposed to when it's uh, custody or whether or not you're going to be released from serving your seven year sentence for distribution of terrorist materials. Um, one thing on that point is a, uh, a good legislative change that uh, is upcoming and uh, had its third reading before the House of Commons on uh, the 4th of June, so last Thursday. Uh, a very positive step in the right direction for the confusing mess that is sentencing law. Uh, the Law Commission had a project uh, that I had to declare an interest I was uh, part of as a researcher. Uh, to consolidate the legislation that deals with sentencing. So the Powers of Criminal Courts Act, uh, a huge part of the Criminal Justice Act 2003, and many, many, many other pieces of legislation will be brought together in one place. The language codified, made simple, made user friendly. Uh, but the biggest change that will be made is that the old law, the historic layers that the law is based on, the old sections of complicated commencement and savings provisions that are normally buried deep within uh, statutory instruments and commencement orders will be swept away. Uh, it should be possible from the day that the uh, code come in, comes into force to simply refer to one living document that will have on its face the state of the law reflected for all cases where the conviction was on or after that date. So not the offence commission date as the law's typically been in the past, uh, because that means that if you're dealing with a historic sexual offence, for example, you have it in many cases to look to the law 15, 20, 30 years ago. Instead, you simply look to the one act. Um, now, it says subject to Article 7 safeguards, and I'm sure some people would say, does this not inevitably raise the risk that you'd receive greater punishment than you could have done on the day? Well, no, in the vast, vast majority of cases, not at all. The law has been tinkered with in a procedural way that doesn't affect the substance of it. Um, but there would be uh, safeguards in place to make sure that there was some reference to the maximum penalty that could have been available on the day you committed the offence. Uh, so that's a, a very, very brief overview of the effect of the sentencing code. Uh, it's expected to come into force, be on the statute book at some point in the autumn. Uh, but as I say, the paving bill that brings this consolidation to the fore uh, has now had its third reading, reading and is awaiting uh, royal assent. 
the draft code bill itself that that will bring into force is available uh, on the uh, on the government or rather on parliament's website uh, and uh, also on the law commission website for those really interested in the nitty gritty of it uh, lastly just two two final slides dealing with guidelines um, we have uh, and this won't have escaped many people's notice, uh, a new guideline in force from the 1st of January uh, dealing with public order offences. Now, there were often, uh, there was a large number of these were uh, offences that had guidelines already in the magistrate's court guidelines. Uh, so the, uh, the, the more commonly prosecuted Section 5, Section 4A Public Order Act offences. Uh, what this guideline attempts to do for, for all courts, so for the Crown Court as well, is give a consistent approach throughout the, uh, the spectrum of uh, public order offences, and in particular to give effect to the difference between an offence when it is and isn't racially aggravated. Um, what's interesting uh, that they've included uh, in the Sentencing Council, they included in that is the, uh, a, a guideline for stirring up hatred based on race, religion, sexual orientation. Uh, very, very few prosecutions brought for this compared to, for example, uh, a fray or, or Section 4 threatening behaviour, uh, but nevertheless uh, quite a, an interesting one for them to include alongside because it, it does fit within that category. Uh, and for those interested, it allows you to look at the, the differing levels of sentence uh, as you move through the public order offence spectrum, uh, both in and out of the racial aggravated uh, versions. Um, again on guidelines, but now uh, upcoming guidelines, the Sentencing Council uh, are definitely trying their best to, to stay, um, stay ahead of uh, the, the time off we've all been given as a result of the coronavirus outbreak. Uh, their 10 year uh, anniversary event was, uh, it seems, indefinitely postponed, but uh, despite not having that, they do have two consultations currently open. Uh, one uh, dealing with assault and attempted murder guidelines, uh, what is being proposed there is that there will, there will be guidelines for emergency worker assaults when at the moment there of course isn't. Um, said to be intending to reflect 12 month maximum sentence, so to give effect to what we've all heard politicians talking about, making the sentence for assaulting uh, paramedics, police officers, etc. Uh, worse. Uh, that's going to not only is it already a statutory aggravating feature but that new guideline will hopefully reflect that uh, we also and this takes us very much back to the theme of coronavirus uh, and it's possible that the sentencing council uh, consultations are alive to this uh, a new proposed high culpability factor of intending to cause somebody to fear uh, harm by infection uh, with reference there specifically to the, the cases where somebody's been coughed on or spat on or told i'm infectious and then uh, spat or coughed on. Um, we're going to likely see a, a new proposed guideline for um, attempted murder that will be brought more into line with the uh, Schedule 21 that gives the effectively the statutory guideline for uh, minimum sentences in murder cases um, and we're expecting the Sentencing Council to give quite a detailed guideline on, on all of this to approach uh, harm and culpability with perhaps more factors uh, than we've seen before, so more categories and more factors to allow a more detailed approach, particularly justified where you have so many of these offences. Uh, the other detail there at the end is the drug offence consultation that's open until uh, it says May of this year. Uh, it's, it's actually likely to be extended or if not already has been extended. Um, Two particular things we're likely to see there. One slightly less interesting is something to deal with those less common drugs, the, the psychoactive substances and, and new, new products, new materials, new synthetic cannabinoids that, that aren't often prosecuted. Uh, but more importantly, perhaps, is the, uh, some reference in the guideline to the exploitation of children, uh, to the use of vulnerable persons in drug dealing, and particularly cuckooing, the practice of uh, taking over a vulnerable person's house to use as a base for drug dealing. Um, and the use of children in county lines operations particularly as well. Uh, so those are things we are expecting to see in upcoming guidelines. Uh, those with strong views on those of course should uh, let the Sentencing Council know because they are uh, at the moment consulting on both of those issues. Uh, so I think, unless I've missed a slide, that is um, the final slide. I don't know if anybody has any questions but feel free to ask if you do. Um, I am um, 
at your disposal. Thank you very much uh, for that, Harry. Uh, as a reminder, please do use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screens if you would like to ask any additional questions. The first question that we've had in is in regards to the slides and whether those slides are going to be available. They are. Um, after today's webinar, you will receive an email that is automatically sent out uh, to anyone who signed up for today's webinar on Eventbrite, and that will confirm that the slides and videos are available. As a reminder, the video will be available both in the news section of Chambers' website and also on the Goldsmith Chambers' YouTube page. So if you go onto YouTube, please do subscribe after typing in Goldsmith Chambers and then you'll get automatically notified each time one of these videos is uploaded onto that page. Uh, we have been asked specifically, please do not email into Chambers asking for those slides as you will be notified when they're available. And we usually estimate that that should be within about 24 hours from today. Um, Harry, we've had another question come in uh, in regards to the fixed penalty notices as a result of the coronavirus. Uh, someone has uh, asked, and I should make it very clear that all questions will be asked anonymously, so please don't be concerned about that. Um, in regards to uh, the, well, very well-known uh, goings-on regarding the legal advisor for the Prime Minister, uh, do you believe the court will therefore be less likely to impose harsh sentences if you were to challenge one of these six penalty notices? Uh, I, well, I, I, I do hope Dominic Cummings hasn't become the Prime Minister's legal advisor, but... Um, oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, misspoke um, there, Harry. Thank you. <laughs> uh, no, I, I mean, I think, I think magistrates particularly um, will be... Will be um, very conscious of what's in the news and, and they will have been told that to set that out of their minds but, and uh, apply the law rigorously as before. Um, so I think if there are cases appearing before the courts that the sentences will be in the sorts of range that people normally expect. This is a criminal offence and it will have been committed in a normal way. Uh, what people will have by way of explanation is, is um, if not defence, is, uh, is the confusing state of the law. Uh, it does a great deal of damage to the rule of law when, when certain people are, are very able to uh, avoid punishment for what seems at face value to have been an offence. Um, so it, there will be cases where, where certain people are able to say, well, I, I thought that law no longer applied. Uh, ignorance of the law, not a defence, um, but it might be mitigation. Um, in terms of the fixed penalty notice scheme, I think we are likely to see a lot more police officers who at the end of the day are the ones with the discretion to decide whether to, to um, um, impose one of the fixed penalty notices or proceed to take further criminal proceedings or, or even do nothing of the sort. Um, there have been reports already, I, I can't point to any source, but I, there have been reports of police officers saying, I, I pull somebody over going to a, a, a local beauty spot with their family or a car full of people or a park where people are clearly gathering in groups of more than six. Um, and they respond, well, hold on a minute, I thought it was all right for him. Um, so I, I think there are certainly a lot of frustrated police officers who at the end of the day make these decisions, who will be sympathetic to the public not really understanding what the law is meant to be. Um, so that, that is likely to be a consideration. Uh, the bottom line, however, is that if an offence is committed, there, if there is an overnight stay at a place that isn't your usual uh, house or a gathering of more than six or a in the worst case scenario a, a restaurant or pub that or cinema that opens in violation of the uh, of the restrictions um we we would normally expect some sort of immediate financial penalty thank you harry uh, the next question that's come in is about bank on sentence and whether it's available um as far as i'm aware it definitely is available i think it was uh, published at the end of april is that correct it it was, yes. Yeah. So the, the new edition of Banks on Sentence uh, is available. It's, um, it's available from all, all good book stops, uh, bookshops, uh, but also from the uh, Lexis website. Um, the, the publishers of it have it available to order in hard copy. Uh, they may have experienced some delays in shipping out copies of it due to coronavirus. Uh, in terms of the digital offering, uh, the situation is that the, the, the former Banks on Sentence app is no longer a thing that's been closed down. Uh, it will be available electronically via LexisNexis and Lexis Library um, as part of people's subscriptions there. I don't know what platform people have with it, what library access they have, but that is, that is I'm told, the, uh, the digital offering. 
offering. Thank you very much, Harry. Um, thank you very much for all of your questions. Uh, we just had one uh, very quickly sneak in. Uh, do you think Dominic Cummings should be given a fine and what his sentence should be? Well, Harry, I dare say that that'd be uh, getting a bit too politically uh, involved um, on behalf of Chambers there. Uh, well, I, yes, I, 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 I won't answer that specifically, but I think, I think if that amounted to an offence um, and if it, if it were admitted um, promptly, the, the sentence would have been a fixed penalty notice and if it were paid within 14 days, it would be a £50 fine. Thank you very much, Harry. And thank you very much, everyone, for uh, joining us for today's webinar. Uh, just a quick reminder, up on the screen there, you do have the clerk's email address. Uh, in particular, our three wonderful crime team clerks, Michael Johnson, John Francis, and Lynn Pilkington. If you do have any questions or queries after today's webinar, please do send them an email. Harry has also very kindly provided his own direct email address as well, if you do have any questions. Also, if you would like a specifically paid webinar if you have any particular questions or queries that you feel that your firm would really like to know um, we will do our best to assist so please do get in contact with the class I'm very pleased to announce that this webinar series has been so popular that it has been agreed that it is going to be extended up until at least the end of June. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning of this webinar, this is the second Crime Team webinar uh, as part of this series. The third Crime Team webinar will be this Friday at three o'clock, which will be uh, a guide to private prosecutions. And that will be led by our head of chambers, Anthony Metzler QC and Adam Gersh. So that would definitely be very well worth uh, looking into as it is going to be uh, an expanding area of practice. The next webinar that we have as part of this series will be back here at three o'clock tomorrow. That'll be a civil team talk uh, guided by Heather Beckett on clinical negligence claims in the context of COVID-19. Uh, thank you ever so much everyone for joining us and Harry thank you ever so much for a very enlightening webinar. Thank you all for coming.